speech by Kerr Hardy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Speech given to the House of Commons in 1901 by Kerr Hardy. I make no apology for bringing the question of socialism before the House of Commons. It has long commanded the attention of the best minds in the country. It is a growing force in the thought of the world, and whether men agree or disagree with it, they have to reckon with it, and may as well begin by understanding it. I begin by pointing out that the growth of our national wealth, instead of bringing comfort to the masses of the people, is imposing additional burdens on them. We are told, on highest authority, that some 300 years ago, the total wealth of the English nation was a hundred million sterling. At the beginning of the last century, it had increased to 2,000 millions, and this year it is estimated to be 300 millions. While our population during the last century increased three and a half times, the wealth of the community increased over six times. But one factor in our national life remained with us all through the century, and is still with us. And that is at the bottom of the social scale. There is a mass of poverty and misery equal in magnitude to that which obtained 100 years ago. I submit that the true test of progress is not the accumulation of wealth in the hands of the few, but the elevation of the people as a whole. I admit frankly that considerable improvement was made in the condition of the working people during the last century. At the beginning of the 19th century, the nation industrially was sick almost unto death. It was at that time passing from the old system of handicraft, under which every man was his own employer and his own capitalist and traded directly with his customer, to the factory system which the introduction of machinery brought into existence. During these a hundred years, the wealth of the nation accumulated, and the condition of the working classes, as compared with the early years of the century, improved. But I respectfully submit to the House that there was more happiness, more comfort, and more independence before machinery began to accumulate wealth. The high standard of comfort reached by the labouring classes at the end of the last century has not brought them that happiness which pertained in England 300 years ago when there was no machinery, no large capitalists, no private property in land as we know it today and when every person had the right to use the land for the purpose of producing food for himself and his family. I said that improvement was made during the last century, but I would qualify that statement in this respect. That practically the whole of that improvement was made during the first 75 years. During the last quarter of the century, the condition of the working classes has been practically stationary. There have been slight increases of wages here and reduction of hours there, but the landlord with his increased rent has more than absorbed any advantage that may have been gained. We are rapidly approaching the point when the nation will be called upon to decide between an uncontrolled monopoly conducted for the benefit and in the interests of its principal shareholders and a monopoly owned, controlled and manipulated by the state in the interests of the nation as a whole. 
I do not require to go far afield for arguments to support that part of my statement concerning the danger which the application of wealth in a few hands is bringing upon us. This house and the British nation know to their cost the danger which comes from allowing men to grow rich and permitting them to use their wealth to corrupt the press, to silence the pulpit, to degrade our national life and to bring reproach and shame upon a great people in order that a few unscrupulous scoundrels might be able to add to their ill-gotten gains. The war in South Africa is a millionaire's war. The troubles in China are due to a desire of the capitalists to exploit the people of that country as they would vain exploit the people of South Africa. Much of the jealousy and bad blood existing between this country and France is traceable to the fact that we went to war in Egypt to suppress a popular uprising, seeking freedom for the people, in order that the interests of our bondholders might be secured. Socialism, by placing the land and the instruments of production in the hands of the community, eliminates only the idle, useless class at both ends of the scale. Half a million people in this country benefit by the present system. The remaining millions of toilers and businessmen do not. The pursuit of wealth corrupts the manhood of men. We are called upon at the beginning of the 20th century to decide the question propounded in the Sermon on the Mount as to whether we will worship God or mammon. The present day is a mammon-worshipping age. Socialism proposes to dethrone the brute god mammon and to lift humanity into its place. I beg to submit, in this very imperfect fashion, the resolution on the paper, merely promising that the last has not been heard of the socialist movement either in the country or on the floor of this house, but that just as sure as radicalism democratised the system of government politically in the last century, so will socialism democratise the country industrially during this century upon which we have just entered. End of speech. Recording by Sally Ann Cook, United Kingdom.